welcome back to my series of videos for Physical Chemistry 1. Today I want to get you to think about something that seems obvious, but really isn't. You might have seen chemistry demos involving liquid nitrogen. That's nitrogen gas that has been cooled to such a low temperature that it liquefies. There's lots of neat things we can do with liquid nitrogen, like making flowers and fruit so cold that they shatter. Liquid nitrogen also has a lot of practical uses. We can use it to cool down some materials so that they become superconductors, which are used in things like maglev trains, which can hover above the train rails and move at record speeds along the track. The reason I want you to think about liquid nitrogen is this. In order to become a liquid, molecules have to attract one another so that they stick together and don't escape to become a gas. But why would nitrogen molecules attract each other? If you think of the Lewis dot structure of nitrogen, you can see that each nitrogen atom has an electron pair on it. It seems like the electron pairs should make nitrogen molecules repel each other, not attract. So how can we ever have liquid nitrogen? The answer involves some of the concepts we talked about in class last time. Molecules can have several different forces that attract them to each other. The ones that I want to talk about today are called intermolecular forces. The intermolecular forces are ion-dipole forces, dipole-dipole forces, and London dispersion. Today we'll look at each of those, and we'll see that they're responsible for lots of the behaviors of liquids and gases. The first of the intermolecular forces we'll look at are ion-dipole forces. Ion-dipole forces are exactly what they sound like. They're attractive forces between ions and dipoles. You might remember from class that dipoles are molecules that have an asymmetric distribution of charge. In other words, one side of the molecule will be more positively charged, and the other side will be more negative. It's easy to see why an ion and a dipole would be attracted to each other. For example, suppose we had a magnesium ion, which has a plus two charge, and some ammonia molecules. If you remember what we learned about molecular geometry back in General Chem 1, you'll know that ammonia is a trigonal pyramidal molecule, which makes it asymmetric. Anyway, because ammonia is an asymmetric molecule, it's a dipole, so it has a negative side and a positive side. The negative side is this end of the molecule, since the nitrogen is more electronegative. Because it has a negative charge, it gets attracted to the positively charged magnesium. If the magnesium is placed in a group of ammonia molecules, the ammonias will orient so that their nitrogens are pointing toward the magnesium ion. This is an example of an ion-dipole force, which is one type of intermolecular force. The same is true if we have a negatively charged ion like bromide. In this case, the positively charged side of the ammonia molecules will be attracted to the ion. The next type of intermolecular force is the dipole-dipole force. Again, the name tells you exactly how the force works. It's the attraction between two molecules that are dipoles. So, for example, if we have two ammonia molecules, the negatively charged side of one will be attracted to the positively charged side of the other one. And that's a dipole-dipole force. Dipole-dipole forces can also occur between molecules of two different compounds. For example, here's a chloromethane molecule. It's asymmetric, so it's a dipole. The negatively charged side is where the chlorine is, so this side of the molecule is attracted to the positively charged end of an ammonia molecule. The other end of chloromethane will be attracted to the negative side of an ammonia molecule. So, our first two intermolecular forces are ion-dipole forces and dipole-dipole forces. Ion-dipole forces are always stronger than dipole-dipole forces, but even though the dipole-dipole force is weaker, it's still strong enough to be very important for the properties of many substances, including biologically important ones like proteins and DNA. In fact, the forces that attract the two strands of DNA to each other, and that cause proteins to curl into their particular shapes, are a kind of dipole-dipole force called a hydrogen bond. A hydrogen bond is an especially strong example of a dipole-dipole force. In order to have a hydrogen bond, one of the two molecules must have a hydrogen atom bonded to a nitrogen or an oxygen. Because nitrogen and oxygen are especially electronegative, they attract electrons away from the hydrogen, which makes the hydrogen a very strongly positively charged one. 
the second molecule in the hydrogen bond must have an unshared electron pair in it. The electron pair has a very strong negative charge, so the attraction between it and the positive charge on the hydrogen in the other molecule is very powerful. Because this type of dipole-dipole force is so strong, it gets its own name, the hydrogen bond. One common molecule that experiences hydrogen bonds is water. Remember, in a hydrogen bond, we need two things. On one molecule, we need a hydrogen atom bonded to an oxygen or a nitrogen. We definitely have that in a water molecule. In the other molecule, we need an unshared electron pair. If you look at the Lewis dot structure of water, you can see that the oxygen in water has electron pairs on it, so it can form a hydrogen bond with the other water molecule. As another example, here's a portion of a DNA molecule. This structure is part of one strand of the DNA, and this part is on the other strand. As you can see, each side has hydrogens attached to oxygens or nitrogens. And on the opposite side, there are atoms that have unshared electron pairs. That means we'll get several hydrogen bonds between the two DNA strands, and this is a major reason why the two strands of DNA stay attached to each other. I mentioned that ion dipole forces are stronger than dipole dipole forces. But both of these are stronger than the last kind of intermolecular force, which is called London dispersion. To understand London dispersion, imagine two helium atoms. Both of them have two protons and two electrons, so they're neutral overall. It seems like they shouldn't attract each other at all, and it's true that the attraction between them is very minute, but it isn't zero. Here's why. From our discussions in General Chem 1, you might remember that the electrons in an atom are always in motion. As a result, sometimes both of the electrons in helium are closer to one side of the atom than the other. And when that happens, the atom will be more negatively charged on one side. That makes the atom a dipole, so it can attract other atoms nearby. The attraction that results is called London dispersion, and it can happen in any atom or molecule. So London dispersion is an attraction that all molecules can feel for each other. This is a much weaker attraction than ordinary dipole-dipole forces because it only lasts for a split second. The electrons move so quickly that the lopsided charge is very temporary. London dispersion isn't named after the city London, but after the person who discovered it in 1930, Fritz London. Fritz London was a German physicist, and because of the rise of the Nazis, he emigrated from Germany in 1939 and came to the U.S., where he became a professor at Duke University. That makes him one of many refugees who made groundbreaking contributions to science in the United States. Anyway, even though London dispersion is a weak force, it's still very important for thousands of different substances. Remember, the other intermolecular forces are ion dipole, and dipole-dipole forces. But nonpolar molecules can never experience those. So London dispersion is the only attraction that nonpolar atoms and molecules can feel for each other. And that's why liquid nitrogen can exist. Nitrogen molecules can never experience dipole-dipole or ion-dipole forces, but they do feel London dispersion attracting them to each other. That allows them to stick together and form a liquid. And that's also why nitrogen has to get so cold before it becomes a liquid. The molecules have to slow down so that they stay close to each other long enough to feel the London dispersion. That's usually true. In order to become a liquid or a solid, nonpolar substances usually need to get much colder than dipoles of the same size. For example, water is a very polar molecule and it has a boiling point of 100 degrees Celsius, so that's the temperature at which it becomes a liquid. On the other hand, acetylene has a boiling point of negative 84 degrees Celsius. The reason it's so much lower for acetylene is that acetylene is a nonpolar molecule, so the only intermolecular force it can feel is London dispersion. So, here's a summary of what we know about intermolecular forces so far. This will be useful to remember. The strongest intermolecular force is the ion-dipole force, which occurs between any ion and any polar molecule. The next strongest force is the hydrogen bond, 
which occurs between any molecule that contains a hydrogen atom bonded to a nitrogen or an oxygen, and a second molecule that has an unshared electron pair. And hydrogen bonds are really an especially strong type of dipole-dipole force, which can occur between any two polar molecules. And finally, the weakest of the intermolecular forces is London dispersion. This can happen between any two molecules, whether they're polar or not. Now that we know about intermolecular forces, we can get a more detailed understanding of the flaws in the kinetic theory of gases that we talked about in the last video. First, because the molecules in a gas are so far apart, the kinetic theory makes the approximation that the molecules themselves don't actually take up any space at all in the gas. Of course, that's not really true. The molecules really do take up some space in the container, even though it's not very much. So as a result, the volume that's available for the molecules to move around in is a little less than V, which is the total volume of the gas. So to make the ideal gas law a little more accurate, we shouldn't use V. Instead, we should subtract the tiny volume that's actually taken up by the molecules themselves. That will be equal to N times B. N is the number of moles of gas, and B is the volume that a mole of actual molecules take up. So that takes care of one of the incorrect assumptions that the kinetic theory of gases makes. The other assumption the kinetic theory makes is that the molecules don't attract or repel each other. This also isn't true. We know that all molecules contain protons and electrons, so the electrons in one molecule will repel the electrons in the other molecules and will attract protons in the other molecules. Because the molecules stick to each other when they're attracted, they collide with the walls of the container with more force. That means the pressure will be higher than expected. So to make the ideal gas law more accurate, we shouldn't just use P. Instead, we make a correction to the pressure, which is N squared times A over V squared. There's a bit of physics involved in coming up with that correction, and we won't be going into that math. The important thing to know for now is that a is a number that tells us how much the molecules in a gas are attracted to each other. So there were two assumptions in the kinetic theory, and as a result, we had to make two corrections to the ideal gas law. If we put them both together, we get this equation. It's more complicated than the ideal gas law, but it's also a lot more accurate. This equation was first determined in 1873 by the Dutch physicist Johannes van der Waals, and it's one of the achievements that won him the Nobel Prize in physics in 1910. Van der Waals was especially interested in the forces that make molecules attract each other. Notice that each of the two corrections in this equation contains a constant, A or B. A and B are different for every compound, so we need to look them up in a book or a table in order to use them in the equation. Here's a table that lists several values of A and B for different gases. Notice that the values kind of make sense. For example, look at the values for the first five gases. These are the first five gases in the last column of the periodic table. As you can see, for the most part, the value of B gets higher as we go down the periodic table. That makes sense, because B tells us the volume that the atoms take up, and we expect them to be bigger as we go down the periodic table. Notice that the value of A also gets bigger as we go down. That makes sense too, because the number of electrons and protons in the atoms gets higher as we go down the periodic table and the constant A tells us how strong the attractions are between the atoms in these gases. So, the van der Waals equation gives us a more accurate picture of a gas than the ideal gas law does. How much better is it? Let's try an example and find out. Suppose we have 0 0.400 moles of chlorine gas at a pressure of 1,000 millimeters of mercury in a 5 liter container. We want to know its temperature Let's calculate it two different ways. First, we'll use the ideal gas law. We want to solve for T, and we have all the information we need. The pressure is 1,000 millimeters of mercury. Remember, we need to make sure we use the correct unit, 
which is atmospheres for pressure. We saw that there are 760 millimeters of mercury in an atmosphere. So our pressure here is 1.32 atmospheres. The volume is 5.00 liters, and N is 0 0.400 moles. You might recall from the last video that R is a constant, 0 0.08206 liters times atmospheres over kelvins times moles. Solving for the temperature gives us an answer of 200 Kelvin. Now let's do this again, but this time using the van der Waals equation. That equation is more realistic, so that should give us a more accurate result when we calculate the temperature. We'll just plug in the same data that we had when we used the ideal gas law. 1.32 atmospheres for the pressure, 5.00 liters for the volume, 0 0.400 moles for N, and 0 0.08206 liters atmospheres over Kelvin's moles for R. In order to solve the equation, we need to know A and B, and we get those from the table that we saw before. A is 6.49 liters squared times atmospheres over moles squared, and B is 0 0.0562 liters over moles. This is a more complicated equation than any other equation that we've solved in this course, so you'll want to take it slow when we start solving it. First, let's solve the fraction in the first set of parentheses. That gives us 0.0415 atmospheres. Notice that the liters and moles in that fraction all canceled out. Next, let's solve this part. That gives us 0.0225 liters. So, the first parentheses gives us 1.36 atmospheres, and the second set of parentheses gives us 4.78 liters. Now that we've simplified the equation a bit, we can solve easily for T. When we do, we get 206 Kelvin. Remember, we got 200 Kelvin when we calculated this using the ideal gas law, so we got an answer that was about 3% different when we used the more accurate van der Waals equation. That's a significant difference, so the van der Waals equation definitely gave us a noticeably better result. Well, that's enough new material for now. In the next video, we'll delve deeper into the differences between ideal gases and real gases, and we'll see that we can get an even more accurate picture of how a gas behaves than the van der Waals equation gives us. I hope you'll join me for that. Until then, have a good week!